Well, good afternoon from Washington, D.C. This is former Congressman Mike Ferguson. I'm the leader of Baker Hostetler's federal policy team in Washington. And we're back this week, uh, continuing with our bipartisan webinar series called Baker Hostetler, Bringing Congress to You. My uh, very happy to be back this week, and I welcome my friend and co-host and uh, fellow senior advisor here at Baker Hofstetler, former North Carolina Congressman Heath Schuler. Heath, great to be with you again. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, glad to be back. Looking forward to hearing from my former neighbor in the North Carolina delegation. Yes, it's uh, very exciting. To, we're going to have two North Carolinians uh, on the uh, on the webinar today, you and our special guest, uh, Patrick McHenry, Congressman Patrick McHenry, he's the Republican leader, the ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, and he he took that role after he gave up a role as the in the House leadership. Uh, he decided to leave the House leadership and move to the top uh, ranking Republican position on the Financial Services Committee to focus on leading on financial services issues that he's been very very active on, very passionate about, and uh, and as you mentioned, he. You and uh, Congressman McHenry represented adjacent districts in North Carolina for several years. Yes, it was always great working with, with uh, Patrick. He was uh, great to work with. We actually shared a county together, so oftentimes our constituents uh, were crossing over. And, and uh, so he would work with my constituents and I would work with his because uh, oftentimes they didn't know which district they were in uh, because it was so gerrymandered uh, through that one community. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, Mike, he's really, um, really focused on a lot of issues in the um, financial services area. Uh, a lot of that came from uh, watching his father struggle in small businesses with the lack of funding uh, in our native rural Western North Carolina uh, when Patrick was a kid. Uh, it's really formed a lot of his legislation and his work that he's done uh, since being elected in the House in 2004. At the age of 29, uh, Mike, that's even younger than it than you were when you were elected. <laughs> that's right. I, I, he got me by a year, and he uh, he did a lot before he even came to Congress. He he served in the North Carolina legislature. He worked at the U.S. Department of Labor before that, and uh, we're delighted that he has decided and made time to join us here today. He's got a lot on his plate. He does a lot of work. And we're delighted that our former colleague, the representative for North Carolina's 10th Congressional District, Patrick McHenry. Patrick, I don't know if you're on the line yet. but I uh, am. Mike, thank you great, so much. Great, great great to hear your voice. You're on with uh, Mike Ferguson. He's Schuler, your old pal. And uh, we're delighted yep, to have I, you on our Baker, Baker Hostetler webinar. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, Mike, thank you. Thanks for your leadership. And when you're in Congress, uh, uh, and now in the in the outside uh, world of advocacy and uh, representing your client's interest and and Heath, uh, my my friend and neighbor as well. Uh, thank you for your leadership um, when you're in the house and uh, now in in this uh, third or fourth career of yours you've had. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you. I'm, I'm well, Patrick, I actually moved into your district. Uh, most people, I moved into your district uh, in November, and then uh, I guess it right after they actually redrew the lines all over again. So uh, living in the in the Buncombe County, sometimes you don't know if you're in or you're out of the district, but uh, um, I, I hate that I'm not in your yes. district. Well, I hate that uh, I'm not with you in, uh, in Buncombe County anymore. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I want to say thank you because... Uh, uh, you, you two both have fantastic relationships on the Hill, um, and you get how to advocate for your clients' interests and and maintain your strong relationships. Uh, and so, I mean, what a what a good duo here. Um, and you know, both of you have bipartisan relationships, but one of you being a Republican, the other being a Democrat. So, um, I um, I I you know want to take plenty of time uh, for for questions, but uh, just want to start by, um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we've got uh, two large societal issues that we're wrestling with 
right now. I mean, a, a pandemic is something um, that, uh, you know, no one in our lifetimes is, is wrestled with uh, how to deal with a global uh, health pandemic. Um, and that is fundamentally an issue of public safety and people's perception of safety. And that is the limiting factor on our economy. Uh, what, what we last experienced in terms of economic pain was a financial crisis that produced economic pain. So you can think of it as uh, a top-down sense of pain, right? So a financial crisis manifesting itself as an economic crisis. This is a health crisis that has manifested itself as an economic crisis. And, and so we have to deal with that issue of, of safety and people's view of safety and health safety. This is what I've been saying for the last uh, two and a half months. Now, on, on top of that, we also have a larger societal issue um, that is something we have to wrestle with, which is also people's perception of public safety. Um, and we have uh, a significant uh, number of Americans do not feel that they get a uh, that they are safe when engaging with our law enforcement. That they are they're not given the same fair shake that other Americans are given. So we have to wrestle with that. They're both issues of public safety um, and, and people's perception of public safety. And if you perceive that you will not get a fair shake in our justice system, if you perceive that you're not going to get um, that there are structural barriers uh, for you, you succeeding, then, um, then there, there, are further, there, there, there are further consequences for that. Uh, for, for Many of us that, that don't have that that uh, feeling that we're going to get an unfair shake, or that there is uh, something systemically uh, uh, waged against us. So um, we're wrestling with these two things in terms of public policy, but there are also larger uh, societal issues that we have to deal with individually and um, and in our places of work and and those issues. So it, it's a far more complex conversation that. Uh, that we're having right now. It's very difficult. So I wanted to say that just as a sort of a level setting before we get into questions. Obviously, there's a, a question of congressional action, the next stages of congressional action, what are the contours of the various trade-offs, but let's get to that in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Q&A and, and that sort. So why don't I hand it back over to Heath and Mike, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Patrick. You're, you touch on, obviously, the two big, big topics, big issues that uh, really uh, troubling the country right now. These are tough, tough times in many ways. We had a couple of great conversations Heath and I did last week on a couple of webinars. We had your colleagues, uh, Jim Clyburn and Steve Scalise uh, on two different webinars last week. And you can imagine the, the really interesting and fruitful conversations we had with both of those gentlemen, both so active, such leaders in different ways and, and uh, accomplished both of them in, in so many ways, much like yourself, uh, obviously with the, uh, your, your role previously in the leadership, now your role as a top Republican on the Financial Services Committee, which is right in the middle of all so much of what's going on with the public policy response to some of these challenges that you were just describing. I want to talk a little bit about the first one, I guess. First, you know, last week we saw the, the jobs report uh, the end of last week, which was very encouraging, surprising, shocking to, to a lot of folks. And then uh, that was coupled with the president signing the, uh, the PPP Flexibility Act last week. Tell us a little bit or maybe share with us your thinking but how is the PPP working, maybe in your district, in North Carolina? How do you see it? How are you monitoring that around the country? How is that working? And, and what are your thoughts on prospects for continued recovery that we saw uh, an inkling of in those job numbers from last week? Well, first, um, the top line, PPP is largely working. Um, I believe a component of what you saw in uh, those jobs numbers last week, a component of that uh, enhancement in payroll or people returning to to the workforce um, was a, a, a in in part due to the success of the PPP program. And again, the PPP program stands for the Paycheck Protection Program. The idea was to keep people connected with their employer and therefore remain employed. 
And the mechanism to do that was a grant forgiveness for the perp for small businesses to keep their payrolls. And so I think that that has had a positive impact, not obviously taking care of the total pain and problem we have, we face. Um, then what you've seen is the success of this program. It, it was designed for, for a shorter time period and a lesser dollar amount uh, than, than how, we've, how this crisis is modeled out. So to change the program, to extend the period of time, um, it was, uh, I think, smart. And uh, what I argued for at the time we negotiated this was a much larger dollar amount for the PPP program. A trillion dollar program is what I thought was, was essential. Um, and to have a, uh, a, a longer period of time. Eight weeks seemed reasonable. But I, you know, I said, you know, far rather uh, err on the uh, on the side of being too generous than not generous enough, given given sort of the unknowns uh, of this health crisis. Um, and uh, so we got to eight weeks. That that was that seemed that seemed okay. Uh, the dollar amount was never sufficient, as we have had to plus it up, uh, you know, twice. So um, so looking at that. Um, we changed that program in a more slapdash manner. Uh, you know, the, the extensions to it, the changes to it that we've legislated, and, um, it, you know, it, that is that too is imperfect. It's an improvement, but imperfect. So with the next round of legislating, which I think will happen really in July, hopefully it'll be in July, uh, not, uh, not later in the year, August or, or September, but hopefully it'll happen in July. And we can have some additional modifications so that you can see the SBA continue to provide their essential work in helping small businesses get lending. That means we're going to have to make some changes and additionalities uh, to their capacity through the 7A and express loan programs. I think that's, that's quite reasonable, quite reasonable additions uh, to the PPP program and what the Federal Reserve has announced to the Main Street Lending Facility. Um, so I, I think I think we're we're taking a, a full full fullness of government approach to responding to this crisis, and I think that is um, that is making things less bad for the average American. Yeah, let me. Um, it's interesting when you talk about July uh, timeframe for another bill. I know Leader McConnell on the Senate side is keeps using the term "if," but not "when." Uh, you know, if we have another uh, uh, relief bill. Uh, and I, I imagine some of that may have been driven by some of the jobs numbers. You may have some people start to make an argument that we just need to let the economy recover and not have another relief bill. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But it sounds like you you believe there will be or should be another another relief bill. Uh, yes, I, I think it's just the question of can uh, can you have a reasonable compromise? And what I mean by a reasonable compromise is some level of state aid, not nearly as generous as the what I think is the absurdly high dollar amount that the House produced, a, a way too high dollar amount that the House produced. Um, so uh, some, some modest uh, amount of state aid coupled with liability reform um, and uh, and I think those are the two key components for the next package. If we can, if we get around that, I think you can see another package. If there's too much greed, and what I mean by that is not ideological commitment to some idea, but but a, a an unwillingness or a lack of willingness to compromise um, around this, then then we won't have a deal. And so we'll, it's going to take another couple of weeks before we know whether or not something uh, even has a shot of flying. Well, your your old neighbor Heath, I know, has a question for you. <laughs> yes, thanks, Mike. Um, Patrick, if, if, when we look at this, this whole package and some of the things and the good and the bad that, you know, kind of transpires after, I mean, we've all been in the situation where legislation in the past, and boy, I'd like to tweak some issues. One of the things that I am hearing from a lot of the small business, particularly in the uh, service industry or the restaurant industry, they're having a lot of difficulty getting their uh, employees to come back to work 
because not only the state unemployment, the other $600 that's tacked on top of it from the federal government, um, they're, t they're telling these uh, restaurant owners, look, we can stay at home and make more money. We're only at 50% capacity or 25% capacity, and the restaurants were not full out yet. So how do we balance that and know that, you know, it's to be able to make sure that people, you know, I think it runs out in July, or we're going to be able to, and I'm hearing the, you know, the Democrats wanting to push it until the end of the year. I mean, what's your thoughts on how that extra $600 that may be impactful in a different way than had, had intended or the consequences that now we're seeing with it? Well, I, I think that, that I just got off a, a, a call this this earlier today with a restaurateur who said that she lost all but two of her kitchen staff um, uh, uh, to the fact that they have this additional supplemental uh, pay. Um, and so they're not willing to come back uh, for a ready job. Uh, I think it's a, it's, I think it's a quite a limiting factor for the economy. I think a, a really bad thing. Uh, so I think uh, th that is one of the other markers here is if if you extend that out through the, the remainder of the year, we're going to have industries that are not going to be able to meet uh, the demand of their customers. And that is going to limit our uh, economic recovery, limit tax receipts, quite frankly, because um, it's keeping them out of the workforce and increase our debt and deficit. So I, I think we have to I think we have to in, ensure that 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 is not extended. Um, and, and again, that will be one of the markers on whether or not we, we can come to terms with a reasonable deal. Patrick, on your Good. role on, uh, sorry, Heath, did you have follow up? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's fine. I was going to ask about, uh, next week, uh, the financial services committee, you've got, uh, chairman Powell coming for his, uh, I guess, semi-annual monetary policy and state of the economy report. Those are always interesting. I know I remember I spent my first term on the financial services committee and it's uh, always so interesting folks like uh, the chairman of the Fed coming up to, uh, to give a report, especially in these now uh, historic times. As we're on our webinar here, some news broke that the Fed said that they were not going to do any rate increases through 2022 which is uh, not something you frequently hear that far out from the Fed. Um, what are you expecting to hear from Chairman Powell next week, or what are you hoping to, to learn from him? Well, I think, uh, I, I think he has uh, adapted to the municipal. First, I would say, uh, I, I think it needs to be noticed, he's done an extraordinary job. He's had enormous uh, foresight in, in positioning the Fed uh, ahead of every other central bank around the globe, uh, save maybe perhaps China because they had additional information on what was happening in their populace. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, Jay has done a fantastic, smart job. Um, and so uh, I think you're going to hear bipartisan, uh, I don't know if praise is the right word given, given, you know, kind of the nature of our politics right now, but I think I think you'll have a, a, a positive reception on the Hill, and I think that's that's good um, and warranted and deserved. Um, second, uh, we want to know more of the details on how they intend to deliver on the Main Street lending facility and the purpose of the Main, Main Street lending facility. Uh, second, uh, second to that, I would say is is or the various facilities of the Fed. Uh, I, I want to understand how they intend to unwind these facilities. Uh, and I think that is a significant question that, that the Fed needs to an answer in a more fulsome way. Um, and I think, and I think he, he's capable of doing that. Patrick, this is Heath again. You know, so how do we ultimately end up paying for this? I mean, if you look at, you know, I guess it kind of goes back to my Blue Dogs day, and, and you mentioned it. If we can't continue to just pile on debt and our deficit, you know, and and how do we ultimately recover from this over a, you know, how many years is it going to take for us just to, you know, to pay back over $3 trillion that we've spent over the last, you know, four or five months? 
Well, I think as uh, Chairman Powell outlined that we're we're in the midst of of a crisis and we have to get through this crisis. That's that's number one. Uh, that is not, you know, uh, that's not my normal position when it comes to the debt and deficit. Uh, nor would it, uh, nor was it yours. Um, uh, but I would say that uh, we're in this complicated time. We've got to make it through this crisis before we can start making those major trade-offs that we're going to have to make that will be foisted upon us when we get to a normalized environment. Uh, the world is swimming in debt, in public debt. Uh, that is a major, uh, major, major problem that we're, we're going to have to wrestle with. But the world, the globe, is going to have to wrestle with it. Our demographics are far more favorable than Japan or Europe. Our uh, public sector debt and deficits are less bad than the Europeans, thankfully. Um, China has structural uh, problems, of demo uh, demographic problems that they have to wrestle with. It is not all uh, it is not all gift to be uh, the Chinese in, in terms of ma maintaining their communist uh, totalitarian state. So it's um, far far comp really significant, complicating times. But I think we have to have um, I think we're going to have to have a empowered um, BRAC-like uh, commission uh, that uh, that forces budgetary change, and we're going to have to have a bipartisan consensus of of uh, of, of doing that. Um, and so Republicans and Democrats are going to have to give, uh, but it's going to have to be a, a deeper structural conversation, not a more superficial one around uh, programmatic changes. I think you have to have a a, a deeper understanding of of our nature of government in order for that, that to happen. But that's coming. Not now, but it's coming. Patrick, you mentioned China. Of course, a lot of folks uh, talking about China and, and there's a, I know there's a task force established by the Republican leadership in the House and um, interested to hear your thoughts on that. But in particular, as a sort of a uh, example of the uh, China sentiment out there right now, of course, because of the pandemic, um, that legislation passed through the Senate a couple of weeks ago. The Ho Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act came came right to the House from the Senate floor. It didn't go through the Banking Committee. It was uh, uh, passed incredibly quickly. Uh, nobody went to the floor of the Senate to object to it. And uh, what what are what what are your thoughts on that legislation? What's the path for that in the House? Uh, and you know, what challenges does that bill present? To make sure that it actually works, if it if it were to actually become law. Patrick, not sure if you're on mute there. I actually muted myself because of <laughs> background noise. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Again, it's just classic problem of, of zooms and calls and everything else. But. Um, um, we have to have a, a deep conversation about uh, our supply chain, of our trading relationships, uh, of our financial entangle entanglements with the communist regime in China. And I think this has to take take in uh, the view from my liberal colleagues that, that have approached this from the, uh, from the issue of human rights um, to, um, to those of us uh, like Heath and I who've worked on trade policy because of the erosion of our manufacturing base. So uh, I think we have to have a whole of government response and a thoughtful response when it comes to China. Uh, the Kennedy bill, I, I think, you know, I think we're, we're working on a way to make it better and avoid unintended consequences. That that's where we are with this right now. Um, I don't think it's in our interest to use security policy, securities policy, um, or, uh, accounting uh, rules in order to uh, move uh, foreign policy. So uh, I don't think this is the best way to get at the issue, but they're getting at the issue, and I think this has more likely than not to pass. You know, you you, um, Water, you and, sorry, I was just going to follow up. You and, you and Chairwoman Waters, you know, you're not, I would say, ideologically very similar, but uh, you've developed a really good working relationship, I think, have surprised a lot of folks. And there seems to be things that you're both willing to work on together. Is that, is that something 
that you're working on with uh, with Chairwoman Waters right now to change that? And if you do make some changes to that Kennedy bill, are those changes you think can then pass the Senate? Um, yes, we're we have conversations uh, happening between Republic you know, between um, uh, Waters and I about this, um, and uh, but there you know there, there's sort of larger forces arrayed on this, so it's it's a it's a little more complicated than just what uh, uh, Chairman Waters and I come to terms with. Uh, what I would say is, um, uh, you know. I've had a, a, a decent relationship with Chairwoman Waters during my time in Congress because uh, I have um, I've given her uh, the level of respect that she deserves. Um, and uh, while we do have disagreements, none of these disagreements are personal. And I've I've tried to let our conversations and negotiations be about the issues we're we're debating, not the wider set of politics that she has or I have. And so um, hopeful that we can um, uh, come to good like we did on um, on working out a long term extension to the export import bank of of making sure the flood insurance program doesn't lapse uh, of, uh, you know, trying to come to terms with the, some some big issues we have to wrestle with in the committee. And a great model. Ways. Of, uh, and I I'm skipped sorry, over three of it getting. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, uh, but we got the terrorism risk insurance, uh, a long-term reauthorization. We got XM, we got a long-term reauthorization. Those things weren't easy to do. We both had to give, and we both had to come to terms with tough things, but we did. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's been a it's been a reasonably productive set of circumstances we've been able to uh, effectuate. Patrick, I know this is not your committee, but when we look ahead, uh, kind of the appropriation side, kind of getting to the funding side of the government, what's your thoughts of not only getting um, some of the the approach out of the House, but ultimately uh, over to the Senate to become law? As because you kind of narrowed down it, we're in election year uh, with the pandemic. We don't have, you know, some of the members aren't in. <laughs> Uh, on Capitol Hill at the moment. So how are you going to be able to get so much done in a short period of time and still have the oversight that's needed to make sure that the, the legislation is, you know, in the right interest of the constituents in the country? Right. Uh, we're not going to do it well. That's how. <laughs> um, <you> know, <laughs> Some things I, I, never I, change. <laughs> gotcha. Very honest. Yeah, exactly. 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 <laughs> Uh, which, you know, there's a there's a great line uh, from the Charlie Wilson movie. It's you know, it's like, well, you know, and, and I've repurposed it a little bit, but you know, why is why is uh, uh, why is the uh, Congress why is Congress so uh, uh, unable to to work well consistently? And I say, well, tradition mainly. Um, so, I, um. So I, I think we'll get a, a probe done. I think uh, you'll you'll see bills coming out of the House that are uh, mini buses or um, yeah mini buses in essence. Um, I think you'll see NDAA produced, but uh, in a in hopefully in a bipartisan way. Um, and I think getting those things done in regular orders is a nice sign. Um, but I still think you're looking at a, 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 a CR come September 30, uh, just because of the forces arrayed to punt till after the presidential election. Um, but I think you could see the CR uh, have a number of issues that are able to ride on it or policies that ride on it if you don't have another COVID response bill in and of itself. So I think you have a couple different vehicles that could make it into law. Uh, no more than uh, no more than a handful, though, between now and the presidential election. Then after the election, we'll we'll see what we'll see what was left undone, and we'll see the results of the election. And that would dictate the the terms of the policy, in my view. Patrick, you you just mentioned um, as one of the areas of uh, accomplishment and, and compromise uh, on the committee uh, flood insurance. What are your thoughts on passing comprehensive flood insurance or reauthorization bill 
prior to the current deadline of September 30 is goes to the sort of the calendar question that Heath is asking. And is there is there time to do that? Are you optimistic that that can be done? Oh, we already did it. We passed it out of committee without a dissenting vote. And and yet, um, you know, I've, uh, uh, yet uh, I've, uh, my uh, Democrat colleagues aren't willing to bring up for a vote. Um, and so, you know, I leave it to them. It's, uh, you know, I did my part in committee. I negotiated a good deal. We had no dissenting votes on that bill. Uh, that's the first time in in my time in Congress, perhaps with with the addition of your time in Congress, that you've seen something like that. Um, and so we we have a really strong bipartisan bill, and yet they won't take it across the, the House floor. And on top of that, you have the Senate in a in a really jacked up position because of people wanting um, wanting to stop something from uh, from uh, HUD uh, and from FEMA, which is a mapping issue. Uh, that they already pledged that they would not do. And so uh, it, it, to me, is the dumbest set of circumstances by which uh, flood insurance is not being reauthorized. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, severely frustrating. Um, and it, is, uh, it shows why uh, flood insurance is lagging behind the needs of the American people, uh, why this, this program is not performing better for the taxpayer, um, and why uh, you also have additional issues uh, with climate change that that are entering that now need to enter the discussion when it comes to flood insurance, and I think would responsibly benefit from a discussion about changing weather patterns and flooding cycles and how we actually model those things out from a governmental risk perspective. Uh, there's a, a story in Politico yesterday about uh, a major undertaking, major study about Fannie and Freddie's book of business, and on top of that, the National Flood Insurance Program, and, and how they, they are not at all accounting for climate science, um, and they're not at all accounting for additional changes in flooding patterns. Even if you don't wanna have the climate debate, you need to acknowledge that you know, weather, uh, weather is a systemic issue, and you, you need to, uh, when you're talking about uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, weather and flooding have a nice linkage. So, you know, if you don't want to get into the wider climate debate, let's at least not be stupid about this. Let's actually have a thoughtful conversation about uh, the governmental risk portfolio here and protecting the taxpayers. So it sounds like you're not getting a signal necessarily from leadership that uh, that that your product, uh, your bill will be coming up for House passage anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, basically, my view was I did my work, and uh, and it, you know when I got when we got this done in May of last year, a year yeah a year ago actually that's fantastic a year ago over a year ago we passed it out of committee, and yet uh, without a dissenting vote. Um, and yet they they can't take it a, a you know you can't actually get this thing across the floor, and you you can't get a Senate response. So I view it this way: is I I did my work, and now there are forces arrayed that I can't control. So I'll sit back, I'll sip my tea, and I'll watch the world go by. <laughs> well, another another topic along along these lines uh, that a number of our attendees have been interested in is is business interruption insurance. And there's some various you know, proposals that have been in introduced to ensure coverage for, uh, for business interruption. It, do you see this as a possible area for some bipartisan work on the committee for, uh, for business interruption insurance? I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. Um, but uh, the current contours of the Maloney bill are, are unworkable in terms of insured risk. Um, it, it, and, uh, what I fear is that if that were implemented, you would, you would not actually improve the situation for average small businesses that have been shut down, uh, voluntarily in many cases, but shut down, um, by force of government in most circumstances. And so, uh, I, I unfortunately think that if the bill doesn't actually, um, meet the need, 
moreover, I don't think um, the modeling of of the risk is is currently sufficient for us to actually uh, get significant uptake in the insurance marketplace. And I don't think that because of it, I don't think uh, a national flood insurance program conforms with the needs of small businesses uh, for a pandemic or business interruption insurance. And so I think we have to work through the model issue. I'm very open-minded about this, very uh, open uh, to uh, new ideas. Um, but uh, what I'm looking at right now is a, is a set of offering in terms of policy that is insufficient to the, the issues that we're facing. Um, and insufficient to the the needs of uh, of the American people. So we got to work through a lot, and it's going to be very difficult in in, in uh, over the next month or two to come to terms with this. So I think this is a longer term conversation we have to have, must have, and um, and and figure out how to actually uh, deal with this uh, for for our the average small business. Hmm. You know, you met, you mentioned before the Main Street lending facilities, and I know you talked several times here today about small businesses and the lifeblood of the economy and getting them back on their feet. There's some concern about some of the lending programs, which are, you know, these are unprecedented programs, right? Uh, some concern that they won't be able to reach the number of businesses that actually need assistance because of some of the terms and conditions. I mean, obviously, this legislation was passed very quickly. Uh, Treasury has been trying to handle tweaks and changes to the extent that they have the authority and the ability to to make these lending facilities work due to some of the unique financial situations. Do you feel, are you in communication? I mean, you must be I'm sure you talk to folks at the treasury department on a regular basis. Do you, are you optimistic or do you think that they might have some of the flexibility or the will to, to make some of these lending facilities work for some of the unique, unique financial situations that some of these businesses are facing? Well, I've talked to the treasury secretary directly about this and, and I would I would say, uh, like Chairman Powell, uh, Stephen Mnuchin has done a a really good job uh, in the midst of this crisis. Uh, he has been um, receptive to new ideas, to pushback, to uh, challenging uh, what is what is the policy they've set out. He's been he's been willing to adapt and change when needed and necessary. And so I give them high marks on that. On this matter of, turn, of, of changing uh, some of these key conditions, we have not had success. Uh, he believes uh, that it, it, he's getting advice from his legal counsel that there are certain things he cannot do. For instance, the loan forgiveness piece to simplify this and, and sort of have a stratified uh, level of, uh, uh, of uh, requirements. Uh, for smaller loans, less onerous restrictions, and for larger loans, you know, more detailed uh, application process. So, you know, I, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, on this, he, he's not been as receptive as he's been on just about everything else. Um, so we're still working through this. I still, I, th I still think there's an opportunity uh, for us to get the Treasury Department to adapt and change, and I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful we can. A question about the SEC. This is just another piece of the sure. vast jurisdiction of the all-powerful uh, Financial Services Committee. You you wrote uh, this week to the SEC supporting its efforts to ex expand some exempt offerings. You know, this is a piece of your committee's successful capital formation agenda over the past decade, you know, helping small businesses raise capital, the JOBS Act, the JOBS Act II. Um, some members on the Republican side, I know, are concerned about spending beyond, you know, the $3 trillion, which has already been sort of sent out the door in some way, shape, or form. Can you talk a little bit about how capital formation changes can allow for growth and job creation and the revitalization of some of the small businesses without necessarily adding to the massive spending that we've already seen. Um, well, um, I, when we passed the Jobs Act, um, and you know, it was there in the Rose Garden with President Obama when he signed um, you know, the the biggest piece of legislation I personally written policy in. 
um, there was such great hope that the SEC would would actually meet congressional intent, and they did not. Um, and and so the 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 biggest the greatest value of the Jobs Act still is is within the Securities and Exchange Commission capacity to make right. And so what the SEC did was complicate these offerings, I believe, rather than simplify them when they could have taken the Jobs Act um, push, the bipartisan push, uh, to remedy some of these offering requirements and to enhance the opportunity for, for individuals to, to invest in them. And so um, what uh, Chairman Clayton is, is focused on is remedying some of those faults and failures that have built up over time with the offering, with the offering structure and uh, the capacity of individuals to to uh, get be a part of those offerings. And so I, I commend him for doing that. I think it's really important in these times to to give businesses of all sort uh, the opportunity for new investors, for new economic opportunity, and for for the bridge to to uh, this this second phase of of our economy, this next phase of our economy. And so uh, really, I, I'm encouraged by the SEC's undertaking and wish it had done, been done long before. By the way, I've seen, I saw some news that uh, Secretary Mnuchin was testifying over in the Senate and uh, essentially said in his opinion that the Fed facilities have unlocked the capital markets and there's a lot of liquidity for investment and um, offering to keep taking a look at things. But it sounds like the uh, response is that you've, you've heard from the Treasury Secretary. He's uh, saying some of the same things to your friends over in the Senate right now as well. So maybe just keep at it, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, part of this I, is, you know, the Fed, the Fed putting out the fires quickly um, and, and, um, and getting basic market function, functioning. So we can actually ensure that this health crisis is going to an economic crisis doesn't uh, morph itself into an, uh, a financial crisis. You know, uh, Patrick, I want to uh, close with a question on the, the second topic, the second big topic that you, you mentioned in some of your opening remarks. Obviously, we've been talking about the economy and jobs and financial markets and, uh, and uh, the, the, the areas of jurisdiction in your committee, the Financial Services Committee. But the uh, House Democrats, as you know, have, are, are working on um, a, a, a bill to reform policing and law enforcement in our country, obviously, the country is going through convulsions right now uh, through the challenge of racism and law enforcement, and how do we how do we continue to try to find that balance? Um, and it's caused a great deal of heartache and pain and, and damage, obviously, for many many people. How are how are you and other House Republicans thinking about this issue right now? And do you think there are opportunities to work together? with your democratic friends to to actually move move legislation perhaps move a package that that could become law with the support also of the of the president um well you know being being away from washington and being distant uh it is is makes it much more difficult for us to get, to um have the type of conversations we need uh around this this uh, not just police issue but social justice issue not just a social justice issue but our judicial process uh and so i think you know you have to have a more fulsome conversation and it's more difficult to have that via technology so having said that i i do think that we can come to terms with the bipartisan package my hope is that uh, the democrats that control the house uh seek that bipartisan uh, bill, uh, uh, you know, the, the, they're in the majority, and and I've seen this before. Being being in House leadership, uh, the the interest is on uh, driving your point as quickly and as as you know as quickly as you can uh, with the biggest bang that you can, so you can go negotiate with the Senate. I think in these circumstances, it'd be really helpful and a positive sign if we could originate a bipartisan bill out of the House and come to terms with some of the key issues that are necessary for us to, to have a, a piece of legislation on this. I think the president wants a, a bill uh, along those lines, and I think we can come to terms with it. But 
we have to we have to have a sort of a reasonable a policy offering and and come to terms with this uh, uh, before we have just sort of a, a a partisan fight about extraneous issues that are not essential to the debate. How opt how opt uh, optimistic are you that that could actually happen, or are you or are you perhaps not as optimistic? I'm pessimistic uh, on the House approach. Um, because uh, it, it appears to me that they, they would like to have a Democrat-only bill. And, um, and look, they, they can do that. They're in, they, they're in charge. Um, they have a majority, and they can drive their agenda. Um, but at the end of the day, that doesn't actually move the, the debate and the needle in the Senate, um, just like they're seeing with the, the, their, you know, uh, three or four trillion or whatever uh, uh, bill they produced a, a month ago. It's, it goes nowhere when it goes to the Senate, when it's just a party line vote. Um, and likewise, if that's what they're going to do, then I don't, I don't think that's going to move the conversation, sadly. Well, I know you share, Heath and I have talked about this. I know you share the sentiment that we're hoping for healing, hoping for constructive, uh, helpful conversations amongst people, amongst lawmakers, and that will help help the healing and help a good policy process too. So, um, Patrick, thank you so much for being with us today. You've been you've been a great guest. Heath and I always love a chance to 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 chat with you. We hope we have a chance to see you in person at some point soon too. Yeah. Thanks so much, Patrick. Amen. I mean, your your leadership's always been great, and uh, appreciate your friendship. And uh, uh, keep up the hard work. And uh, you uh, you have our support. Well, thank you, Heath, and thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you all uh, on the call as well. Um, but Heath, Mike, thank you. Thanks for your friendship. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks again with all that you have going on for making time for us. Heath and I have a couple of closing comments, but uh, thanks, Patrick, for being with us, and we wish you well in all your work. Thanks. God bless. Thank you. So, Heath, uh, we're going to be back before we know it uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow we actually uh, another great guest, uh, uh, one of my close friends, uh, Steny Horder, will be with us tomorrow. He is the the majority leader of the House. He's, uh, we've had some some great guests. We've had some high ranking guests, and uh, he's the highest. <laughs> he's going to be with us uh, to give us the latest on the House agenda tomorrow morning at ten o'clock Eastern time. Uh, so we hope everyone will be able to join us again. Please feel free to share the invitation that you received from us with your friends and colleagues and uh, send us your questions for asking of the majority leader tomorrow morning. So uh, with that, Heath, I look forward to chatting with you tomorrow with our very special guest, the majority leader of the House, Denny Hoyer. And thank you all for joining us. Again, this is Mike Ferguson. Good afternoon from Washington, D.C.